Hey. Hi there. So first thing I want to ask just to get uh, clarity on this. So Diane is your doctor's name and then we got Diana. Yes. I'm yeah. pronouncing it right. <laughs> so my um my birth name, right? Um is um Diane. But I'm going to tell you a story about that. My okay. mother told me that she first wanted to call me Sarah. Um but um, my mom um, and dad were Jewish. And I think in Yiddish, the word Sarah sound, is similar to Saras. And Saras means sorrow. So she didn't want to name me Sarah. So she named me Diane after her one and only doll. Okay. okay. Uh, and I have a, um, like a Hebrew name. And it's Adela Liba which is unusual because it's kind of more German than I think Hebrew, but Adela Liba means noble love. Uh, so going back to my professional name, you know, it's Dr. Diane Kaufman, but I really prefer Diana to my creative self, you know, kind okay. of mythology, right? Artemis, Diana. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess with all our names, there's always a deep spiritual meaning behind it that actually yeah. links us up, you know, with the universe and our journey that defines us. So, like, uh, just off topic of birth, so, like, I'm quite spiritual myself, and I've started going deeper into numerology. And what I found out for myself is, like, when I define my life birth, you sort of evaluate for yourself where you've actually been going wrong. Like at moments in life, you'll be going down the path and you'll be wondering, okay, why is this not working out for me yet? It's something I want to do. Yet we're going down the right path, but we're going about it very differently or incorrectly. So that's when you find that, okay, you know, like my name, what it actually means. And when you add up all your numbers and so on, and it brings so much more meaning to your life and this purpose that you actually, um, you know, been sent here to actually do. So it's good to know. No, I, I think it's... I, I think it's interesting how, of course, like our, our parents name us, right? But we have to also name ourselves. So I think that's interesting. Sure, I gave sure. myself gave myself a spiritual name, and it's a, it's a play on um, MD, right? medical doctor, right? And so I called myself, uh, initially this was all one word, and then I separated it into two words. But I name myself Mia Diana. So it's M I A, which, if you switch the letters around, it's I am. So Mia and Diana, which is D Y A N A H, which is a Sanskrit word that means creativity. So. Okay. Wow. <laughs> and, some, wow. and, some, and sometimes I sometimes I will, you know, I remember I would go to the dry cleaner to pick up my clothing and I would use the word, yeah, you know, I would say that I was Mia, right? <laughs> so, so I, yeah, so I think that the, the language becomes so interesting and fascinating. And also, yeah. why should somebody else name you? I mean, we're ourselves, Ooh. we should Ooh. name ourselves. Yeah, like for myself, for example, um, the story that my mother told me when I was born. So my nickname is actually Kino. My birth name is Kramesh. And she said she never come up with the name Kino. She says when I was born, there was a nurse that was in the hospital who gave me the name Kino. And she doesn't remember who this nurse was. And she said that the moment that she heard this name, it stuck. It just stuck throughout my life. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure it was like know some angel out there who said okay we're going to name you kino and there's going to be this deeper meaning in your life as you move on and i guess yeah you know you learn as you go more about yourself absolutely quite interesting yeah but thanks for sharing that i mean you the amount of effort that you put into your name uh it's the first time i've ever encountered that so yeah thanks for sharing that so the topic, um, so of course, yes, we're going to jump into your artistic journey, your music, your poems, which I'm so excited to hear about. I've been researching about you like the entire week, getting whatever <laughs> information I could get. I viewed, I think it was Asher International, if I'm not mistaken, that you did a speech. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That was actually international. That was that actually blew me away. It was so emotional. And I mean, the center of today's show is a topic that has defined your life as a psychiatrist, as a person, as an artist. It's a topic that can become like so overwhelming. It carries so many different hats, suicide, mental illness, depression, mm-hmm. anxiety. And it, be, it can become so overwhelming for so many people out there, so emotional. And one of the things for myself that I figured out on the topic itself, that even though there's heroes such as yourself, and that's what you are, not sure if anybody ever told you that or they keep telling you, they should be telling you that, that you're a hero in society. So even though there's heroes like you out there who have created organizations that actually brings awareness to these topics, I still feel like there's like this gap from society in bringing in awareness and of course awareness for the individual themselves because so many people like just like they like push it aside. They don't want to admit that, look, I'm going through something right now and how do I find the help they actually need it to actually get through this and overcome it? So not sure if you agree on that, but it is something that I've evaluated, you know, in my personal life as well. So like for myself personally, being an artist myself and being a producer and being in the music industry, I branched out and then I started being a consultant in uh, helping independent artists establish their own career. And the narrative is with these guys is okay, that as soon as they get into the game, they're going to jump into studio, they're going to lay down their lyrics, and that's it for them. But what I've also evaluated that there's so much trauma going on in that individual's life as well. And in order for them to actually go to the next level of their career and the level after that, they need to fix that trauma. Because somewhere, somehow, down the line, something is just going to drag them back to day one. And you're going to share your expertise on that as like, you know, we move along. And not only is something, this is something that I've evaluated, like in society, but also in my own personal capacity, what I've gone through, like any other person or artist out there, just like yourself, you know, I'm not afraid to admit it, that I've gone through dark times, I've fought my own demons, there's been depression, there's been anxiety. And then I reached a stage in my life where I realized to myself, look, something is not right here. And it's going to take more than crafting my skills in the music industry yeah. or reading motivational books or reading motiv- motiv- sorry, motivational videos. I actually need to work on myself. I need to work on my subconscious. I need to fix that trauma. I need to go back because before I can actually move forward. And I feel the universe has brought us here together. It's such a special topic. And I'm so pumped up and I'm excited to hear what you have to say about it. And I want to go layers, you know, with this podcast. So, yes, we're going to jump into your music and it's going to be shared with the audience and who views it. And I do hope that there's traction that comes towards it and, you know, you continue to make a difference uh, worldwide. But I also want people to, like, get to know you, like, intimately. Like, you get so many people out there, they'll be like, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. You've never been through it. So how can you tell me what to do with my life? You know, you get those sort of situations. So, yeah, so I mean, the stage is yours, the floor is yours. You can take us, um, you know, from day one. And as I did say, you know, you're you're a hero. When I watched your speech and then I looked at someone who went through so much childhood trauma, who had expectations from their parents and they felt bad about themselves and we see that a lot also in society today. And you overcame that. You've gone through suicide attempts and you're still here today fighting on and making such a huge impact. Um, it's truly amazing. So I just want to tell you that it's truly amazing. And thank you so much thank for like, coming on and sharing the story, you know, with uh, my audience and me personally. And this is going to bring so much value to me as well. Thank you. Uh, where should I begin? Well, you can start, you know, at like uh, when I watched your your speech at Asha with Asha International, you know, mm-hmm. from the word go, you know, if you don't mind sharing, you know, like your childhood journey, you can keep it brief, you know, moving into adulthood and, you know, into like creating this platform for your artistic work. Okay. Uh, let's see. Well, I'll be, I'll be going to begin by giving my age, right? So um, I am uh, 71 years old. So, no ways. <laughs> yes. No <don't> look <laughs> and, and so, seventy-one years ago in March, um, uh, I was born, 
And I, uh, when I was born, the story is that my parents told me that I was sick when at, at birth, um, and I stayed in the hospital um, at least a couple of days. Um, I was um, vomiting, losing weight. Uh, my mother thought that I was going to die. And my mother told me, probably because she was becoming depressed, that she um, stopped visiting me in the hospital because, out of fear that I was dying. Now, of course, somebody else might have gone to the hospital to be with their baby. But my, my mother, I guess, was, was so racked with um, sorrow that it was too much to go to the hospital. My dad told me that he was searching for a surgeon because they thought I had something called pyloric stenosis, uh, which is a tightening of a part of the, I think it's uh, maybe near the intestinal tract. So he was looking for a surgeon to help me. Um, meanwhile, there I am in the hospital and it ended up that a nurse who I consider to be my guardian angel, my, a nurse told my father that I was being neglected in the hospital and that if he wanted to save my life, he should take me out of the hospital. And that's exactly what happened, right? And so I was discharged from the hospital and my mother explains how she used to feed me like a heavy consistency formula, you know, early, very early on. And she jiggled me around so that I wouldn't vomit. Um, and, and I started to thrive. Um, and, and so that was my very beginning of life. And sometimes I look back, you know, coming also from a medical profession, knowing that those first, what, few hours, few weeks, let alone years of developing attachment and um, safety, right, that your needs are being met, that I've wondered what that did to me. Um, being right alone in the incubator, you know, for several days without, I'm sure, um, a loved one holding me, right? It must have had some impact, right? Mm -hmm. um, but be that as it may, um, you know, thankfully I um, didn't perish and my, my dad, that nurse, right, who I have to say, I really did consider her, looking back on that, that she was an angel in my life. Um, who knows what would have happened if I stayed in the hospital. Um, and I'm, I'm the youngest of three. I have an older sister who's seven years older, an older brother, five years older. Um, my brother and sister uh, were super bright. Uh, and both of my sister and brother were valedictorian in their high school classes. And that was wonderful. And also for, but for me, and I don't think this was being put on me from my parents, but I began to feel a lot of pressure to succeed and in competition with them. Um, and of course, because I was seven years younger and five years younger, there was, you know, that there was some, um, not that I ought to have been competing, but there was no way to compete because they were so much older than I was. Um, I think an ex a potentially an example of that is when I was in elementary school, I ended up plagiarizing two poems. So I was in elementary school and I said that I had written these poems, which is interesting that I ended up becoming a poet. So way back when I wanted to be a poet or I saw that as a way to get attention. And unfortunate for me, one of those poems was being published in, an, in a, like a elementary school booklet or journal or something. And somehow, I don't know how this, how this happened, whether my mother explored this poem 
or I told her or the teacher told her. I don't know how it came to light, but they found out that I had stolen the poem. Um, now, I have to say, both of these poems were by Anonymous, right? So, and I think I knew what the word Anonymous meant. <laughs> so, yes, I was stealing it, but it was from Anonymous. So, I remember my mother being understanding. My mother was an, she was initially a science teacher, and then she became an elementary school guidance counselor. So my, my mother had a heart for children. Uh, my father didn't really have a heart for children. I think he preferred older youth and children. Um, I remember my mom was really understanding. But my dad was really angry at me, you know, for doing that. Um, so, and then they never found out about the second poem, right? <laughs> that, that's still a secret, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> and when I was um, when I was a young girl before I think it was before well I'm thinking it might have been around kindergarten or so um, I had a um, um, sexual molestation experience um, and I'm going to jump to decades later and then I'm going to go back so, so many decades later, maybe when I was, I don't know, 40 or something, I reached out online to an, a girl that was a neighbor who lived next to these youth that I remember having molested me. And I emailed her and I asked her, do you remember anything about these neighbors, right? And I have some memories about them. And she shared that she that she had been terrified of these neighbors and gave some examples of that. Okay, now I'm going back into the past. And I'm going to forward again to the reason why I reached out to her was to like almost to get some other verification outside of my own memory. So going back to my childhood, my mom saved most of like my compositions from being a child. And I have in my own handwriting a composition that I wrote that I believe I think it was for school because it has, you know, it has my name. It said Diane K. There was a title. It's and the title was My First Enemy. And next to it are two little stick figures of, um, I don't know, little people. And then it describes a situation um, of my going over to this these friend's house. There was a boy that was in my class and an older sister and another older sister. And I'm not going to go into any detail about what happened, but... The, des the description is of my going over there, laying down on a rock with sort of my butt up, and I'm wanting to escape, and I'm calling out my mother's name, and then I'm find houses to get back home. Um, and again, the composition is detailing this, and it's hard for me to believe I made this up. Um, and I have memories of parts of this and also running behind the houses to get home. Um, and I do have a memory of standing in the street, um, no cars going by, but standing in the street, my mother's there and I'm talking to her about it. And one time I talked to my mother about it years later and she told me that she remembered my telling her something about how my underwear had been pulled down. So there was this abuse experience and they just lived, like I lived on the top of a hill and they lived on the other side of the block, I'm gonna count, one, two, three, like four houses down on the other side of the block. And 
I continued to live there and they continued to live there, you know, all through, you know, when I lived there through high school, right? So this, and, and the incident of what happened, I don't remember, and when I say I don't remember, I don't think it happened, any further discussion with my mother, there certainly wasn't any discussion with my father because I think my, my father would have attacked the other family, right? And, and maybe my mother was even afraid to tell my father that something happened. Uh, and I'm not even clear if my mother fully comprehended or if I fully told her what happened. Um, so potentially she didn't fully know or she was in denial about what had happened. Um, but that I, I know that experience must had to inform my whole childhood because it had happened and they still lived there and I still live there, right? Um, and then in terms of, you know, going on in life, um, I was always um, a creative child, um, like to draw and, you know, like, you know, make things. I'm a, I had little pipe cleaner creations, right? Um, and always good in writing. Um, and I think I started to feel internal pressure that I needed in terms of a career to follow what my father wanted us to be, right? So my dad, a very intelligent, you know, man uh, who um, was a chemist and a vice president of a um, what was it like flavors and fragrances, you know, corporation. Um, he very much, I think, esteemed, you know, that a person should be a medical doctor. And in my family, my father was very uh, kind of ruled the family, and I would use the word tyrant. So it was his way, or you weren't being spoken to. Literally, you know, I can remember an entire summer when my father didn't talk to me. Um, and also the possibility of being kick, kicked out of the family, right? Emotionally kicked out and financially kicked out, um, which actually happened um, to my older sister for, a, for no good reason. There should be no reason at all, but this reason was like no good reason. So I was witnessing all this as the youngest child, right? Uh, and I know that it shaped me because, you know, when, when, you're, when your voice is not being developed, meaning um, perhaps the parent who it might be, they have your best interests at heart because that's what they think is best, right? Um, and maybe back when I was being raised, it was a different kind of mindset around parenting, right? The, the child may not have had as much influence as they have today. Um, but if you feel that no one's listening to you or no one's encouraging you or no one's wanting you to develop yourself, you start to form yourself around other people's expectations. So you don't even think about doing other things because that's just the yeah. way it is. Um, so I ended up, um, uh, even though a part of me, I think very much wanted to be like a writer an English major an artist, right? Um, I um, ended up uh, going to, um, going to medical school. You see, my brother and sister were both, both became doctors. They not only became doctors, but they were additionally in MD, PhD programs, combined programs. Um, both of them eventually in their training um, um, ended up, I think each of them didn't get a PhD. They ended up getting a master's and, and, and an MD. Um, but, but that's like very, very high level academic training, MD, PhD. Uh, and so my sister became a pediatrician and a geneticist. And my brother had a master's in chemistry 
um, and he became a psychiatrist, an adult psychiatrist. Um, I'm going to go back a little bit in time in terms of what be, developing one's voice and independence. That when I was growing up, um, I couldn't have said to my family, you know, I want to get a job um, at the local coffee shop, right? That this is where I want to work, right? That it, it we had to work where um, my father said that we were going to work, right? So, uh, you know, my my brother and sister ended up working for summers at, at a, uh, um, there was a, 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 a um, cosmetic company called Helena Rubenstein a, a long time ago, and they worked at that corporation. And when I was in high school, I worked um, for my dad's company. In fact, when I said my dad wasn't talking to me, um, it was during that time I was working um, it was a summer and I was working with him in the summer um, and he was angry at me and uh, he wasn't driving me to work. Uh, I would um, have to take, my mother would drive me to the train station and I'd have to walk maybe 15, 20 minutes in a not okay area to get to the plant where he worked. And the same thing would happen going home, um, which, you know, I would never do that to my own child. You know, it's, it's I think it's emotionally yeah. abusive behavior. Yeah. Um, you just keep so, impressing me with your stories. Okay, so um, so there I am in in me in medical school, right? And I think to become um, see, I think I w I was afraid to be myself, right? Uh, and what I ended up doing was I be so my sister was a pediatrician and my brother was a psychiatrist. So what I ended up doing was first doing pediatrics. So I did an internship and two years of residency in pediatrics and took my boards and peds. Uh, and then I immediately turned around and I did psychiatry. And then I did a, a fellowship in child psychiatry. So I think that Looking back, trying to understand the path that I took, I almost feel that I felt that I had to be my brother and sister first before I could become myself, right? Um, and then when, um, and then, you know, I, I worked at, in New Jersey, um, the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey in Newark, New Jersey. Uh, I worked there for 28 years, and UMDNJ eventually became Rutgers Biomedical and Health Sciences when it merged with Rutgers. And during that time, I was medical director. I became, first, I was an outpatient psychiatrist, and then I was medical director of the preschool service um, that expanded to also include um, a therapeutic kindergarten. When, when I began, there was an infant mental health program, a therapeutic nursery. And when I was involved in it, the outpatient service expanded, and we developed a therapeutic kindergarten. And I also um, wrote a, a first grant. Um, I, I developed a project called Parents for People Too. And that was related to um, helping to prevent, you know, child abuse. Uh, I had just become a parent myself. My daughter had just been born. Uh, and the, the programs around parenting, um, I think there were between, apart from if you had abused your child, you were mandated to take a parenting class. But as a new parent, I was thinking, whoa, you know, being a parent is wonderful, but it's also very stressful, right? And you're, um, you need support. Everybody needs support around parenting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I developed, you know, that project. Uh, and then when I was at UMDNJ, um, I, um, I also later became the medical director of something called CMOP. It was the Crisis Intervention Mobile Outreach Program. Uh, and during that time, I very sadly met a grandmother and her little girl. So the little girl might have been about seven years old. And the grandmother brought her in because the father had murdered the mother. 
And when, and when I had interviewed the child, I had asked her, which I would often do, you know, for magic wishes for a better life, right? Uh, and she told me that she wanted to fly on the back of a bird to see her mother again. And I was so touched by what she said that I ended up writing her a story. Uh, it was called Missing Mommy. And it was just two pages long. I gave the story to the grandmother. So I believe I must have met them two times, the first intake, and then probably we were referring her to outpatient treatment. And then, then since I had written the story, to give the story to the grandmother. And I said to her, if you feel one day this would help your granddaughter, you know, let her know it was written just for her um, from the doctor that had met her. In the story, the little girl has a magic dream. And in her magic dream, she sees her mother again. You know, she, she flies on the back of a bird and she grows wings and she sees her mother. Uh, and then she, she is home again and she's um, triumphant and she asks her grandmother, did it really happen? And her grandmother recites to her a very beautiful story, a poem about love. And at the end of the story, they're embracing each other, um, crying, but also feeling love for each other. And the last line of the story is, um, in the story, the little girl's name is Layla. That wasn't her real name. Um, but at the last line is, um, and in that moment, Layla felt um, safe and loved, um, and the tears glistened like jewels upon her face. So... Decades and decades and decades pass. And then 10 years ago, my daughter um, gave birth to her baby, Nori. And I started thinking about that story again. It just popped in my head. And I thought about, well, why was I thinking about this story? And I'm thinking because one, because my daughter was now a mother, I was now a grandmother. And my mother had died a number of years before in a car accident. So maybe internally all those things were swirling around. Uh, and amazingly, and I believe in cosmic connection, amazingly, I went on Upwork, um, uh, a freelance site, and saying I'm looking for an artist for a bereavement story. Uh, and maybe I had 20 people submit ideas for the story. Um, and the artist I chose, and I have to explain, I was still living in New Jersey. My daughter lived in Portland, Oregon. So I was visiting Portland, you know, to be with the baby when she and my daughter when she was born. And there I am in my daughter's home, you know, also logging into Upwork. The artist that I ended up choosing was Hadley Hutton. And she was an artist who lived in Portland, Oregon. And I met her before I, I, we went to tea together in a place called Townsend Tea. I met her before flying back to, um, to home, to New Jersey. But on that flight home, I had an epiphany. And the epiphany was that I was not flying home, but I was leaving my home. And a few months later, I moved from New Jersey to Portland to be with my daughter, right, and and her family, mm -hmm. and and then amazingly, just to show those cosmic things, maybe mm, um, it, it could have been a year, maybe within a year later, right. So I I had hooked up with Hadley; she was going to do the artwork, and the book the book is absolutely beautiful. The illustrations are breathtaking, and. I was in New Jersey visiting a friend of mine, and we're in a, um, a, a children's clothing store. And my friend, Karen, who's a music therapist, she says to me, oh, you should let them know about your story, Bird That Wants to Fly. This was a story that I had written, and it's about a traumatized bird who can fly, but it's afraid to fly. And it meets a magical horse and who listens to it and encourages it to fly. And as a subtext, I wasn't like thinking this when I wrote the story, but the bird and the horse together is Pegasus, 
right, which is a symbol of poetry and creativity and transcendence. Anyway, I'm in this store with my friend Karen, and she says, oh, you should tell them about Bird That Wants to Fly. Oh, and Bird That Wants to Fly inspired an opera, and that's another story. So I'm in this store, I'm in this store, and Karen says, oh, tell them about Bird That Wants to Fly. So we're right in front of the um, counter, and I said, oh, I will, but, you know, I'm working on a new story, you know, it's called Missing Mommy, and the illustrator is so great, her name is Hadley Hutton. And, you know, it's funny, because why did I even say her name? That wouldn't necessarily mean anything to my friend. But I said, and her name is Hadley Hutton. And the woman there in New Jersey says, Hadley Hutton, she designed our business card and stationery. And she holds up the business card. <laughs> and then I like took a photo of her and the card and I, and I sent it to Hadley. I said, you are not going to believe this. So I don't know. Like, how do, how do you explain things like that? <laughs> okay, there's some things that you just can't explain. You just can't explain. But you just know, like, sooner or later, um, you just know that it's meant to happen for some specific reason. And there's a deeper meaning, you know, behind it. Is this the universe connecting again? Yes, yeah. yeah and then the I, I have another example of that. When one time I was coming home from work in Newark, and my father had recently died. Um, and my, my, okay, so I'll explain it. I'm driving home. It was very close to just leaving work. It was within maybe five minutes of leaving work. And I'm, I'm driving a green VW, um, uh, um, like a, bu a bug. And the car next to me, we're at a light, and they lower their window. And the, the there was a mother and a child next to her, but I couldn't see the child. And the, the mom, the woman, says, oh, my son like likes your car, right? Or a nice car. And I said, Oh, you know, I thank you. And I said, you know, my, my dad had bought me the car, right? So this shows another side of my dad. My dad had bought me the car. And, and I might have said, I don't remember, but I might have said, and he recently died, right? And the woman and the child in the other car, and here we are like stopped at a stoplight. The woman says that her son wants me to have this. And what it, it was, was a small, this size, green VW car. And so they threw it in the air from their car to my car. Yeah. So when these, when these extraordinary um, <laughs> stuff happens to you, what have you for yourself over your life period evaluated for yourself like what makes sense to you and why it actually happens i know everyone has like a different opinion and there's people out there who focus like solely on spirituality and the cosmics and so on how do you sum it up for yourself that, i i mean i don't believe in god as a quote person right but i Same. think that there's some right. cosmic healing energy that brings people together you know just like what is it the uh, the bee goes to the flower right to pollinate yeah, yeah, yeah. is being brought together that if one is open to the signs and the symbols that that energy is there so i i, I didn't feel that all the things that i shared with you i i didn't feel that they were like accidents I didn't feel that I had made that happen at all, other than me being open to possibility, you know? True, true. Like, like as humans, we're not meant to chase. We're meant to attract. Like mm -hmm. you mentioned a key word, energy, you know, law of attraction. What energy you put out is what you're going to attract to you, and hence why you and I are here together today. And... This is something that I believe wasn't planned when you got a hold of contact details 
to reach me and say, can I be a guest on the podcast? For me, I believe this was planned like a long time ago. Like anything that happens in our life, it was planned like a long time ago. And I mean, I'll tell you like just really quickly, uh, like a personal story of mine. So since 2009, so music has always played like a role in my life. Like you're either born with it or you're not. Uh, it's like a typical example would be like when before COVID, I used to host events. And that's when I was like at the peak of my DJing career. And I would book these DJs to come through. They were independent DJs. They needed a stage to shine on and showcase their work. And I would give them this opportunity. And now when I look at post-COVID, none of them are actually in the game anymore in any form, which means you weren't really born with it. There has to be like a bigger purpose behind it. You did it for the fun of it or for the money, whatever the reasons may have been. And as an artist, any form of artist today, I won't pin it down just to those involved in music, but any form of artist, there's a deeper purpose behind it. And once you understand that there's a deeper purpose behind it that's meant to be shared with the world, that's when you know this is what I'm actually supposed to be doing. Um, you know, you feel it sooner or later, you're going to know, okay, cool. I can't just be like a singer or a poet or a DJ or a music producer. There has to be this bigger purpose that complements it, that's going to give back to society, that's going to help the next person. And you have done that very well for yourself, and you're still doing it. And I'm sure you're going to be doing it for, you know, the remainder <laughs> you know, of you know, this life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But back to my story, like, so in 2019, I decided for myself that I want to focus full time on my music career. And this is now not having this expectation that a uh, global lockdown was going to come our way. So, I was planning, so a few months before I made that decision, I woke up one day and I had this calling. Now, at the time, I've never been out of South Africa. So till 2019, I'd never left South Africa. And from all the countries that could ever come to me in some spiritual, magical way, and that time I wasn't so into spirituality. Like, I don't know what was happening. You know, when something, like I should always feel like when something bad happened, it was something bad happened. You know, why is this happening to me? And then as you move along and you get deeper into it, you realize, no, this is actually happening for me. It's teaching me something. It's taking me in the direction that I always wanted to go because this was my purpose from the day uh, I was born. So I woke up this one morning and I'm like, I need to go to Thailand. I don't know why I need to go to Thailand, but I need to go to Thailand. <laughs> so Fast forward a few months down the line, I decided to go to Thailand. So I decided to take also my father with me. And from the moment I touched down in Thailand, my life changed. Like when I saw how they go about life, how deep they are into spirituality. So of course, yes, there's partying and there's drinking going on. But the people absolutely blew me away. And the respect they actually have, not just for human beings, but actually any living creature. Actually, like, you know, that hit me a lot. And it's not like I went in deep with doing any sort of Buddhist prayers or anything of the sort, but just being there for that two weeks, like, just transformed my life. Where I came back to South Africa and I was like, yo, what's happening? And it was then and there that I made the decision, look, I'm going to leave 50% of what I was doing. So I had a career in logistics and I'm just going to focus on music. I book a ticket like two weeks later to go back to Thailand in May of 2020. And this was like going to be like a permanent move for me. So here comes COVID. So of course, everything just comes to a standstill. There's no going to Thailand. And then once again, I'm in the situation where I'm thinking to myself, like, why is this happening to me? Like, what have I done wrong? And now when I fast forward to 2024, just being here with you on this podcast and looking at how my career is actually evolved, I wasn't meant to go to Thailand and I've accepted that in my life. Many people don't really accept it. They still carry that sort of internal grudge with them. Oh no, like the universe has it in for me. Why is God doing this to me? And that's just attracting more of that negativity to their life. And that's what like, I try my best to explain to people. But now when I fast forward and I look at it, I'm no more playing the victim in my life. No, why did this happen to me? Life sucks. I should have been in Thailand. I should have been in the beach. I should have whatever, you know, whatever the agenda was at the time. But if I did go to Thailand when I was supposed to go to Thailand, 
I wouldn't be here now. I wouldn't be having this conversation with you. I wouldn't be contributing to humanity. You know, and that's what I've like evaluated myself, evaluated for myself. So now anything at any scale, micro, macro, that happens to me now, I know it's happening for me, no matter what I may be going through. It's how I looked at anxiety and depression, which, uh, look, it's sort of a trend. It's a norm with artists. You can relate that we all go through it. And at times we can be our worst critic when it comes to our work. Instead of giving ourselves credit for pushing out our best and trying and tomorrow look, we're going to wake up and we're going to do better. We tend to be our worst critic. And that's how it always was for me, even when I was like just like a professional DJ alone. Um, I was my worst critic. So I should go through these dark phases. I fought these demons. It was depression. It was anxiety. And in 2020, it happened to me a lot. 2021, it happened to me a lot. But even though it was happening to me, I just started pushing through, pushing through, pushing through. And as I started to go deeper into myself and spending time with myself and just being present in the moment, not looking back, not looking forward. Yes, I can be honest to say, yes, I still go through dark phases like probably any human being out there, there's phases that we go through that we can't make sense of in the moment. But how I go about it this time around is so much more pleasant because I know it's happening for me. I try to look for the deeper meaning. Why is this happening? What am I supposed to be learning from this? And surprisingly enough, it can be a day, two days later, even two weeks later, I'm like, ah, there's there. You know, that spark goes off. That's where that happens. So I could find out this. So, yeah, you know, um, we just have to trust the process. That's probably yes. what everything does happen for, you know, a reason. Yeah, so that's my personal, like, story that I just wanted to share up here. That and that's, that's a, such an important shift that you talked about, right? The potentially for things happening for us versus feeling victimized by life. Yeah. Yeah. No, definitely. So before we move on, I mean, as you were talking, there was a few things that were popping through my head. So there seems to be like this trend because it's also happened in my personal life where if you're the youngest and you have older siblings, you know, the narrative is you have to be at their level. You know, like you mentioning it and explaining your story, you know, another spark went up like, wait, this also happened to me and this happened to a few more people that I've also spoken to and I see it happening around and you sort of like don't make sense of it in the moment. Like I still have these arguments with my mother at times, but it's not like intense arguments. It's just that my siblings and I, just like your siblings and you have taken different paths. So like uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Like even though your siblings are in the medical field, are they also like, you know, focusing on something bigger than just being in the medical field like you are? Is it like, you know, the Hold On campaign, which you launch, have they done like projects like that? Uh, so um, I, I would say that I, I, my passion um, about arts and healing, which I can also share in a moment, there was an inkling of from, from my childhood that I think that in difference or contradistinction to my brother and sister, um, although they're both creative people, that, that, uh, that I very much combined that and made it into a life passion and took it, be, took it beyond um, the confines of my work-defined life. I, I feel that I created something else um, out. Even when I was at UMDNJ, I started something called Creative Arts Healthcare. Um, so going back to the very beginning that we, when we were talking about just the use of language and words, you know, Creative Arts Healthcare, and you know, I my um, part of my email address became Arts Medicine as one word. You know that you're almost creating the language of what you want it to be, or you know, to manifest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah? I was I was going to mention that, but I'd also want to say that my my brother has written poetry, and he's written poetry related to helping people. Uh, especially with epilepsy, my my brother has epilepsy, and he's uh, written uh, poems, you know, around that, and and is an advocate, you know, for people with epilepsy. 
um, my, I think my sister is similarly an, an advocate around people with genetic disorders. Uh, so I think that it was instilled in us to help others, right? Um, that that was a, um, a guiding principle. Um, and looking back when I, when I was younger, again, one of those compositions my mom saved, it was one of those writings where you're talking about what you want to do when you grow up or what you want to, there's a difference between what you want to do and what you want to be. But <laughs> what I wrote in the composition, I said I wanted to be, um, I think I wrote a, med it was medical dash, drawer, D-R-A-W-E-R, -E medical drawer. And I'm not quite sure what I meant. Did I mean like an illustrator for medical things? But I absolutely believe I became a medical drawer. <laughs> and, you know, yeah. and um, I, I want to share a little bit about, you know, my own mental health journey. Um, so, you know, I, I was a, a sensitive child. Right. Um, I, I, I was a, a bit of a weepy little girl. Right. Uh, and I used to write poetry. Um, and I, I have some poems that I wrote during the Vietnam War. Right. Um, very poignant, you know, poems about um, people dying and the people left behind uh, weeping. You know, and the title of the poem was The Red, White and Blue. And the, the red, I think, signified, which is the American flag, but it was the red of the blood and the blue of the sadness. But the white was of the numbness, right? Uh, dissociation and numbness that's described in the poem um, of the people left behind. Um, and then when I was in um, college, there were some episodes of deep sadness, right? So I can remember times of, of course, you had to get out of bed to go to your classes. But I remember times when maybe I was a bit struggling to do that, but I did that, um, attend my classes. Um, and, and then when I was in medical school, um, I have a diary in which I had was writing poetry. And I have, in my own handwriting, I have poems that clearly describe myself as seriously depressed. Um, um, there was one poem where it's talking about, um, on my birthday, they gave a lecture on depression. Right? So I'm in medical school and I'm attending a lecture and I'm writing on, on my birthday, they gave a lecture about depression and it goes on something like, and I wondered what it was like to be or be not. And, and in the, corner of my writing, the poem ends, and in the corner, it says suicidal ideations from life's frustrations. Then there are some more poems, and what one poem is talking about, it goes, I am flotsam, uh, floating away. Uh, then, then there's a poem where it's more excitable. And I don't know if that was like a good thing, or maybe in retrospect, I was getting a little hypomanic, because it's talking about um, the mad MAD, the mad leaves falling from the sky. Okay. And I'm asking them to teach me to fly. Okay? Then there's a poem, which is absolutely like get this person to an emergency room where it's talking about that I'm ugly, I'm worthless, no one loves me, no one ever will love me. And the end of the poem is something like, I'll, I'll have to kill myself so I can hide once more, right? Yeah. Um, and I'm glad I have these poems, trying to look back at my experience, however, writing a poem is not the same as getting help, right? I mean, yeah. it, it is a form of help. I mean, as long as you're writing and creating and drawing and singing, you haven't killed yourself. However, it alone, at least from my experience, it was not what I needed to get well. Um, and and uh, I don't know how soon after that poem I attempted suicide. But I did attempt suicide 
It was serious. I was alone in my dorm room on purpose. Um, I took an overdose of prescribed medication that I thought would kill me. Um, and uh, I, my fantasy was that I was just going to fall asleep and not wake up. However, the medicine that I took um, caused me to become very sick. And I, was, I started to feel abdominal pain, nausea. I started vomiting. And I realized that I was not going to die. Okay? And I was feeling so sick that I um, contacted my sister, who lived in um, a taxi ride away. Uh, this was in Brooklyn, where I was in medical school. And I went to her home. Uh, and I don't remember if I told her what I did. I, I might have told her what I did. But when I was at her home, I started vomiting blood. And at that point, um, I went to the emergency room, um, um, a hospital called Mount Sinai Hospital in New York, where I was in the emergency room, and they treated it as an emergency, as it was. I had an NG tube, you know, charcoal NG tube. I don't recall gave me Ipecac, which would have made me vomit even more. Um, uh, and then I was um, stabilized and medically admitted for a couple of days. Um, and I can remember in that, being on that hospital floor, I can remember that there was a young, there was a girl next to me. Um, and when I say girl, maybe she, maybe she was, um, I don't know, in her 20s. And and she was crying throughout the night. I remember that. Um, and a, a few days into be, my being still in the hospital, one of the doctors um, spoke to me about, did I want to be transferred to the psychiatric unit? Because I was on the medical unit. Now, now, at this point, I was no longer acutely suicidal. So they, they could not involuntarily ad admit me. Um, and I was thinking, um, you know, I'm not suicidal now. And it was also like, no way am I being admitted to a psych unit because in my thinking, I'm a medical student and I, you know, I want to become a psychiatrist. And how can you ever become a psychiatrist if you've attempted suicide and you're on a psych unit? Um, and so, yeah, and I, I <laughs> and also I wanted to forget this happened. It was like, I wanted to totally block it out consciously and unconsciously. It was like, you know, this, uh, this can never happen again. And I want to forget it ever happened. And I want to just go back to medical school. And that's what I ended up, you know, doing. I, but I, I do believe, could be wrong, but I, my feeling is that if I had said to that doctor, yes, I want to be admitted to the psych unit, I think he would have admitted me. Um, and part of my thinking is that he, he, he knew that I was no longer acutely suicidal, so it couldn't have been an involuntary admission. So why was he asking me if I wanted to be on the psych unit? Yeah. Um, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. And then I recall my, you know, I had no income because... I didn't have a separate job apart from being, a, you know, the medical student. Um, so my my father was paying for my, I saw a psychiatrist afterwards um, for treatment, and my dad was paying for the sessions. And I can recall that my dad, um, well, he was angry at me for for trying to kill myself. He wasn't compassionate. He was angry. Um, and I can remember him having the check, you know, that I would be giving to the doctor to pay for the session. I can remember him holding the check way above his head in the car as we were drive, as he was driving me to my appointment so that I would have to grab the check out of his upheld hand, which I, which I felt was to humiliate me or I felt humiliated by you know what he was doing and then even though I don't remember this or I did not remember this at all my father 
maybe 30 years later, he told me he wanted to apologize to me. And that was something my father never did. But he said he needed to apologize to me. So I said, like, what? And he said, when I had attempted suicide, he had said to me, Diane, the next time you want to kill yourself, um, tell me, because I'll tell you the right way to do it. And that was totally obliterated from my memory. But clearly he remembered it and it had bothered him all those years, you know. Um, and then, you know, I, I, I in, when I was in medical school, I was writing poetry and I even remember trying to write songs. Um, there was some piano in some open area in the dorm, you know, building where I was. Um, I can remember um, before, in front of my parents singing some of the songs, you know. Now, I didn't, I had taken the piano, I took the violin for a little while, but I, I uh, could barely read music, you know, and, uh, but I sang them these songs that, that I had, you know, written. And I can remember crying, like for, for singing it and then breaking down crying. Um, I don't know if that was out of nerves or out of emotion. And, and then, you know, I continued to write poetry. I, I shared how I wrote that um, Missing Mommy. And then I wrote Bird that, the story Bird That Wants to Fly when I was in an arts and healing workshop. I wrote that for my own well-being. And the, um, the writing prompt was really interesting. We were, after doing warm-up exercises, um, we were asked to take our, take three pieces of paper use your non-dominant hand, which was my left hand, to scribble, not intentional, draw anything, just scribble on the page, three parts of yourself. So one, two, three parts of yourself. Then look at the scribble and see if you see anything. Um, and then pull out the image and title it. And I thought I saw a bird and I tied, and I pulled it out, added to it, and I called it Bird That Wants to Fly, which was me. And then the, the second one looked, I made it into a horse. I called it Beautiful Animal That You Are, and then I called it I Am. And then the last was a loop-de-loop, -loop, and I made it into a roller coaster um, and, and with a please enter sign and the words please enter and arrows. And I titled it Roller Coasting is Fun, True, False, or Both. And then we were asked to stand in the center of a circle and embody the image and speak for it. And then we were asked to write, which was a powerful exercise. And I would say it was like Carl Jung's active imagination, you know, that they were utilizing. And this story just literally, figuratively flew out of me, for like first word to last word, the entire story. Um, and how it became um, an opera is that I was I had collaborated with the nursing department at University Hospital to start Creative Arts Healthcare, which would bring in poets and storytellers and photographers to give um, grand rounds, you know, teaching um, to healthcare staff, um, as well as um, I had. Um, collaborated with an arts organization who needed new space uh, and they ended up providing bedside services to patients um, and were able to pay for space in the hospital. Um, and so creative arts healthcare was happening and the hospital had themselves, or I think it was the nursing department, had themselves applied for a grant. It had nothing to do with um, um, creative arts healthcare, but was now sort of under the umbrella of creative arts healthcare. It was to um, hire a computer animation artist to work with patients with sickle cell while they were in the hospital. So I was um, elected to go to the grants meeting in downtown Essex County in Newark. So I about the grant, and I'm at the meeting, and there was a very tall gentleman who was looking at his computer. And I walked over to him and said hello and introduced myself. And he ended up to be um, Kevin Maynard, 
who was the director of Trilogy and Opera Company in Newark. He was also an opera singer, and he had received a grant, and that's why he was there. Um, and I thought, oh, wow, maybe Trilogy could come to the hospital and do, you know, opera performances for patients and or employees. And so I invited Kevin to come over to my office, you know, uh, a couple of weeks later. So Kevin's in my office and, you know, he is the, uh, the ultimate artist, right? And he's talking to me and I wanted Kevin to understand that I was an artist too that it wasn't that only that I was a child psychiatrist and I had started creative arts healthcare, but I had artistic endeavors as well. And it's one of, again, one of these cosmic things. And it just so happened at university, at, at the medical school, which was kind of directly behind my building where we were meeting, that there was an art exhibit and the art exhibit was open to anyone a volunteer, student, um, healthcare staff, not patients, but anyone else to exhibit their photography, their sculpture, their painting, you know, et cetera. Um, and I had Bird That Wants to Fly, the three pages of the story typed were framed. The storyboard by a just graduated artist, Olya Kaletsai, who was from a program called Salve Regina University in New Newport, Rhode Island. I had done an, a, an expressive arts facilitation training program. But I developed, I had a certification. Um, so I had graduated from that program and I was looking at their college catalog and I saw Olya just graduated and she had done a book on zoo animals and I loved her artwork and that's how I connected you know, I called from Newark, New Jersey, I called Newport, Rhode Island, and I said, find Olya for me. And she and I worked together. So I had, there was Olya's storyboard, one completed illustration and one illustration in process. So there were one, two, three, four, the three illustrations, the story, and it was right in the medical sciences building. And I, and Kevin and I really want you to picture this because it's like so unusual. You know, we're in the foyer. He's looking at the story and he's a very towering, tall man. And he's literally tapping the glass of each word of my story. And then he turns to me in the medical sciences building and he goes, um, this would make a beautiful um, op children's opera. You know, like, would you like yeah. that to happen? And I mm -hmm. said, yes. And then he calls up the composer, Michael Raphael, in, 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 right there. And I was able, fortunately, to pay for it myself. But it became an opera. Um, and with professional opera singers, there were also younger people in it. Um, there was a professional dancer um, in it. And a friend of the opera company is Danny Glover uh, the actor? And Danny Glover narrated the story for like a, a, a audible download of the opera itself. So he reads the story first, and then you hear the opera. Wow. Like I look at how we started this conversation and your childhood and the trauma that was experienced there, and how things from that moment, how you found the strength to actually prevail move forward and just go level to level to level. Like everything was just like in sync. Like you did one thing which created opportunity for the next thing, which created opportunity for the next thing. Yeah, it, it feels but, like there's um, there's a thread. You know, somehow there was like a thread that is interwoven with a lot of, not just my experiences, but people's experiences. There's a poem I think it's, it might, if I'm remembering right, I think it's by William Stafford, and I hope I'm quoting right. I think it may be called The Way It Is. And he starts off talking about a thread, that like there's a thread, right? Uh, and that you need to follow it, right? Yeah. Um, so so I, I was sharing about 
having, you know, attempted suicide. And then I was in treatment. In the past, I was on medication, you know, mood stabilizer, um, antidepressant. Um, at some point, it became clear that, that it wasn't like, um, major depressive disorder, but that I had a bipolar disorder. It's um, bipolar two disorder. Um, to clarify, bipolar Roman numeral one is episodes of mania and um, depression. And most often a person with bipolar disorder, they may not have yet had the, the mania or the hypomania because the depression is more common than the other symptom. Um, and so they're coming in for treatment when they're in the depressed state. Um, and mania is you, it, it's a physical disorder. So yes, there are psychological ramifications, but it's truly a physical disorder. Um, your sleep is disrupted. Uh, you don't need any sleep. You have tremendous energy. Your, your, your thoughts are racing, running a mile a minute. When you're talking, you may have word salad, it's called. Like you're jumping around. It doesn't make any sense. Um, you can have grandiose delusions, like religious delusions. You can become extremely irritable. A person could, and I've met, I've met adults like this, you, you could nearly bankrupt yourself because you're so impulsive that you're spending nonstop on your credit card. Um, and um, you become overly sexual. And this is, this is like not you. This is the illness taking over. But the even more terrible thing is that the person in a manic state doesn't even realize something is wrong, right? So to yeah, yeah. anybody else, there's something terribly wrong. But to the person experiencing it, they don't, uh, they, they're unable due to the illness itself to have insight into what's happening. Um, so that can be mania. And there's other symptoms related to mania as well. And, and a risk too is when you're manic, you can go down into depression and a person can become psychotic, you know, visions, voices, etc., cetera, uh, in the state of mania. Um, and hypomania is when a person has an upswing from their normal functioning, which does not necessarily feel bad at all. In fact, it can feel good. So you have a bit of an elevated mood. You're not sleeping as much. You're maybe you're spending a little more money. You're more social. You're calling people. Uh, you're funnier, right? You're more creative. You're more everything. Um, but it, it hasn't reached the extreme of mania, thank goodness. Uh, but it's definitely different than your regular mood. And I, I know for myself when, when I'm experiencing that hypomania um, is that I, I feel almost, if, if I could, if I could um, be a bottle of champagne that's bubbling over, that's the feeling that I have. I feel when it's in its positive feeling, it feels effervescent. I feel effervescent as if I'm a bottle of champagne with the bubbles. Right? Yeah. That's, that's how it feels. And I can remember there was a time that, um, when um, I started, um, fortunately, I, I was not bankrupting myself. Um, but all of a sudden, I, who was quite conservative in spending money, right? Yeah. That all of a sudden I was watching the home shopping network and I was buying lots of things <laughs> and there was boxes being delivered to the house like all the time. <laughs> and my daughter <laughs> told me um, in the recent past, like, oh, wow, <laughs> like that was weird that that was happening. And because it was so out of character. You know, and, and I know that was when I must have been experiencing so, some hypomania, ver, you know, verging on mania. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, so um, thankfully, I never attempted suicide again. And I say thankfully because, you know, some, some people who are not aware of this might think, oh, well, if the person is just 
attempting suicide over and over again. You know, it's like they don't really mean it. It's a quote, a cry for help. Now, there's nothing wrong with a cry for help. That's good that the person is crying for help. But a person who is having more than one suicide attempt, they could end up killing themselves. So it should not be um, diminished, the fact that they're repeating that behavior. And, and I'm fortunate that I had the fortitude not to repeat this. The experience really scared me. And I realized not only did the experience scare me, what I was capable of scared me. So I knew that I could cross the line <laughs> into that. And I never wanted to do that again, right? So in terms of self-care, um, I tried as much as I could to be aware that um, stress in my life, um, not eating right, not sleeping enough, getting involved in unhealthy relationships, that, the, that these kind of stressors could, um, quote, unspin me, you know, like my yeah, mind, yeah, yeah. unravel me. And that if I get unraveled, I'm potentially at the risk of hurting myself. Um, and so I, I, it was a learning experience for me. And so I, I'm just fortunate that I never went in that direction again. You know, I certainly have had episodes of feeling depressed since then, you know, that, um, and I've always, but I, but I also want to say this, I, thankfully I've always been able to function. So I would always, you know, I would do my job, you know, I would do well at my job. There was also, I think, a call to to function. You know, I had responsibilities that I had to do. But I also want to put that in the understanding that the illness was not as severe as it could be for some people, because you can want to function, but the illness is so severe you can't. You know, so it's yeah. it's not a it's not a function of oh. I'm doing a better job than somebody else is just one particular person's circumstances. If you really think about it, um, and I learned like a lot about this when I did the deep dive into Whitney Houston, it's the base, because when I shared, you know, lessons around, I thought could actually work for you to overcome addiction. And it was based like on research that I saw online it's the basic things that you could actually do that's going to cost you nothing. As you said, you know, your relationships, what you eat, getting enough sleep, uh, you know, the basic things you could do to overcome it. You know, like we, we so consumed in this world with medication. And I'm not saying that not all medication is bad, but there's a limit to it. If we go back hundreds of years ago, when we think about, okay, how did the average human survive back then? You know, or even 30, 40, 50 years ago, you know, you didn't have the medication that you have today in 2024. So like the basic things you could do for yourself that can actually enhance your spirits, your happiness, your life overall. Like we look at everyone who, like the people who complain about what they don't have in their life, Versus, you know, just looking at what I do have and what's working for me and showing gratitude for that. That just by showing gratitude for that each and every single day and just living in that abundance of whatever it is, is going to bring whatever you may feel and moment is short in your life. You know, it's something basic you can do. It's not uh, studying 24 hours a day, not getting sleep because you want to get that dream salary or that dream job. But if you fall dead, you know, it's not going to be worth it anyway. But if you just adjust your lifestyle and adjust your energies, those things, you know, do for the place. You can heal. You can self-heal. Like is the point yeah. I'm getting to. You know, you can. Uh, you have that capability. And something that I've been thinking about recently is the role that grief loss has in people's lives and how they're able to um, live on, you know, or be aware that they're, they may be experiencing a grief, not only from, let's say, of course, we grieve when a loved one dies, but the, the loss of a relationship, right? Or the loss of a dream that we 
we thought we it was ours, but we lost it. And how we're how we're able to grieve that, and how we're able to outwardly mourn that. You know, um, I'm I'm I and two collaborators are giving a presentation online on August the 25th. It's through the Mental Health Academy. Um, which is an amazing organization that provides online education. Um, it's a suicide prevention summit. And they graciously, it's either free of cost, zero dollars, or ten dollars if you have like a little bit more access to the recordings. Um, and I think it's August 24th and 25th. And I'm giving a presentation called Love, Grief, and Suicide, and, you know, an expressive arts approach to that. And since I have an interest in, in suicide prevention and the use of the expressive arts, you know, I've, I've been really thinking, is it possible, again, not in all cases, but in some cases, like, is a suicide a grief that was not able to be mourned, right? That uh, that a person can feel, and again, when when you're in that suicidal state, your mind has clamped down. Your thinking becomes so constricted, right? Like a pinpoint, you know, of pain, and it's not going to end. And killing myself is the only way out, right? Um, and yet, you know. The, that that isn't the way out you know that's the final way yeah. out. we're, we're yeah. all going to die that's going to ha that will happen right but in order to endure the pain whatever that pain is i i believe there is there is a way right um yeah. seeking yeah. letting somebody know i i know i was talking before about writing the poem right when i was in medical school but i hadn't shared with anybody how i was feeling I wasn't yeah. getting any help, right? Um, so for someone, and and I and the someone especially includes men in addition to women, because I think men maybe because of how they're socialized, reaching out for help is not necessarily seen as a thing to do, um, and yet reaching out for help and just showing like, hey, I'm human, just like you're human, right? Um, that it, it's so important, right? To, to let somebody know how you're feeling, to not turn to drugs and alcohol, it's just gonna make it worse. Um, you know, there are more deaths caused by guns for suicide than there are, is for homicide. So locking up guns or locking the gun, having somebody remove the gun is very important. Um, therapy, medication can play a role. Hospitalization or residential treatment or IOP, partial care can play a role. Um, you know, not that all suicides can be prevented because I don't think that's true. But I think efforts can be made. I would say yeah. the vast majority yeah. of suicides can be prevented, right? And and that that leads me um, into the Hold On campaign because what happened was, well, in August 2019, again, very sadly, I'm looking on Facebook and I see that a friend and former work colleague died. Her name was Stacy. And she um, had been working at an agency that I worked at when I first moved out to Oregon. And then I had left that agency and I don't know, maybe it was a year and a half or something, two years, and then I went to another agency. Um, so I read that Stacy died. Now Stacy was only, I think about 48 years old. Um, and I, I like Stacy, I'd been to her home, the group of us that worked together had gone out together. Um, and I admired her as a clinician. She was a nurse practitioner. And I had even said to myself, if somebody needed help, I would send them to Stacy because she was skilled in so many ways. So I was shocked when I, I saw that she died and didn't know why. 
And I contacted a mutual friend who also had worked at that same agency and learned that uh, my friend had developed a terrible depression, uh, was in and out of the hospital, was unable to work because of, of course, because of the illness. And um, her, um, her mother had come to stay with her to help take care of the children. One day, Stacy got hold of the car keys, which were hidden from her, and she drove to a bridge and she jumped off. And she, she left behind two sets of young twins. And I was absolutely shocked by this. Um, and it felt to me that like a cancer, her depression had devoured her. You know, that, that was not Stacy that, that did what she did. Um, and shortly after that happened, the same month in August, I'm walking down a street that happened to be named Lovejoy, Lovejoy Street. And it's parallel to the street that's right outside my window. So parallel street, one block over. And I'm walking to Starbucks. And that, tree, that street is tree-lined. And I noticed a tree that had branches coming off its kind of upper trunk, but below where the branches were ordinarily coming off. So those branches looked unusual to me. Um, and I took a photo of the tree and I wrote down either when I was kneeling next to the tree or when I got to Starbucks, so I don't quite remember, I wrote down the words, um, shame, what was it? Shame kills, hope lives. Um, just something like just, like, just like this tree, we all yearn to grow. And then it was every day is suicide is prevention day. Um, take take something like take care of yourself and may you grow ever stronger in your love. So I sent my words and the photo of the tree to an artist collaborator, Amanda Meador, and I asked her to create a poster. And she created a beautiful poster um, with the words and an illustration of the tree. However, when Mandy sent me back the poster, at first, there was no earth around the roots of the tree. And I said, you know, you got to add the earth, like ground the tree, ground the person, add some flowers to it. And that beautiful poster um, became, I used it as an art card with suicide prevention resources on the back of the card. Um, and I also want to say that I'm offering to your listeners and anyone else if they want this image, they can use the image and put their own suicide prevention resources on the back of the card. And mm. I also had the poster um, enlarged to seven feet tall. And I bring it to NAMI Walks, National Alliance on Mental Illness uh, walk events, where it always draws attention because because it directly speaks to suicide and, and it's a beautiful image. Um, and that began something that I, that I named creative lifelines. So, you know, creative, so you talk about a lifeline, like a telephone hotline. So, but this was a creative lifeline and it reaches out with compassion and creativity to save lives. So that was in, in that was in 2019. And then that, started a whole series of suicide prevention posters that I did with Mandy. Uh, there was one for mothers and children, fathers and children. The one with fathers and children um, says, it's okay to share your feelings, right? Um, there was one on bullying, one for the military, um, silence, shame, and stigma, right? And then help for the helpers. So there was a whole series of them that were done, which I look back on that and I think that I was grieving the death of my friend and I was creatively mourning, you know, the mourning is the yeah, outward yeah, yeah. expression of the grief. And I also want to add that sadly, terribly back in, 
2016, a teenage patient of mine died by suicide. Um, she uh, just hanged herself. And that was literally the day after I had seen her. I saw her on a Friday. She was with her mother. There was, she mentioned being bullied, um, but otherwise had denied suicidal thinking. Um, she was on uh, medicine for ADHD. Um, uh, and the mother and I had even commented to each other because she ended up leaving the session because she was walking to school. So she was in the session, she left, said goodbye. The mother and I were still together. And the mother and I had both smiled at each other and we said to each other how well she was doing. And the next day she killed herself, which it was unbelievable, but real. Uh, and I believe it was an impulsive act. Yeah. I, 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 that she. Like you just never know. Mm -hmm. You can never know what someone will, you know, maybe yeah. going through in that present it's moment and it makes it so dangerous yes yes and that i think these experiences and writing the poetry and i want to say with the death of my patient about a year and a half later or so i was taking um watching these online videos about arts and healing um and the instructor gave um an assignment and it was to write a poetic progress note and, and it, was, it was interesting because I was watching the video on Memorial Day, which was a holiday, and it was the last day these videos were going to be online. And I had purchased them, but I hadn't been watching them. So I was glued to my computer watching all these videos. And then when the assignment was a poetic progress note, I wrote a poem about the last day that I was with my patient and she was with me, and I called it what makes us, like what makes us live or die. And then I ended up, um, um, through Upwork probably, um, finding actors, two actors um, and a director who created a, um, like a poem video of, of that last day. And the end of the video has the suicide prevention number, and it also says you don't have to kill yourself to end the pain. So I think part of healing is to take our experience or the experience, our experience, our experience of others, and try to um, help and to prevent some other heartache to happen to the next person. And then there was, in maybe a few years later, there was a popular series on Netflix called 13 Reasons Why. Uh, which was all about a storyline about a teenage girl in high school and how she ends up killing herself. And she has all these videos of all the people in her life that she feels had done her wrong. And it was called 13 Reasons Why. And um, in fact, there were articles in child psychiatry journals about whether 13 Reasons Why was increasing the suicide rate of vulnerable people that were watching the series. Uh, and I ended up renaming what makes us the, the, the video that I did. I called it 13 Reasons Why Not. Um, so these threads of creativity and suicide prevention were like continuing to get woven together. And then I'm continuing to write some poetry. And I wrote a poem for my patients called Don't Give Up. And it, I think it was near the, near the time of COVID. Um, and the poem had starts off, don't give up even though you want to, right? And I ended up collaborating with uh, um, Lucia Martinez Rojas from Colombia, South America, whom I've collaborated with before. And she created a beautiful animation um, using her own hands in, in the animation uh, in a very interesting way, like having a dialogue between her hands um, and then almost her, the hands embracing each other. Uh, just beautiful. 
and again has the suicide prevention number um, and encouraging people to reach out. And my thought was that, you know, through a song, you know, listening to the song, maybe a person in distress would listen to this song because the lyric is telling you, encouraging you what you need to do, right? And helping your thinking get clear again. Uh, so there was Don't Give Up. And then I, then in December 20, I think it was 2020, I read in the New York Times of the death of Stephen Boss, uh, AKA Twitch, who was a um, creative um, director who was working with Ellen DeGeneres and he was a dancer and he was on Dancing with the Stars and his wife, Alison Holker, he met her dancing and they were celebrities and I did, I did not follow him on social media, but apparently he was a larger than life, full of life and love spirited man, greatly admired. And he ended up dying by suicide. Um, and I wrote a poem called Heartbreak Times Infinity about his death. And it's talking about the heartbreak that your mind, your own mind is trying to kill you what it's telling you, and then acting on the thoughts, the loved ones left behind, right? And it ends by begging the person to get help and not to hurt themselves. And it also includes a stanza, uh, which isn't in the song, but it, it's like, and did this ever occur to you? If you kill yourself, you're killing a part of all of us too, right? So I reached out on Upwork and I found a artist named Shan Carbello. Um, little did I know when I met Chan that he had experience with depression and suicidal thoughts. He hadn't told me that initially, but in, in the clip of his idea for the music, I just thought he, that he was really able to do this. And he took the poem, which had a repeated stanza of like, but hold on, hold on, your thoughts are all mixed up right? It's like feelings come and go, the pain isn't going to last. That you have to remember that. The, because if you can hold on and not act on the suicidal thought, you're going to stay alive, right? So he ended up creating this very beautiful song, Hold On, which again became a video and had the suicide prevention number and it said heartbreak can heal, right? Hold on. Uh, and that song ended up winning all sorts of awards, international awards. Um, what happened was um, here it won, I think it had won an award in Paris. So some Paris film festival that won a best something award. And, and Kino, I'm feeling like super jazzed that it won an award like in Paris. But then at the very, there's like a split screen, but at the very same moment, I'm feeling totally despondent because, but no one is listening to this song and yeah, yeah. I can't get a mental health organization to put the song on their website. And I want the song on to be heard and to be used for the purpose it was made. So on the one hand, I'm exhilarated that someone recognized the, the beauty and skill of the song, but it, it also didn't meet the need, the real need of why the purpose, what you were saying before, the purpose of the artwork, right? So I went to sleep feeling so despondent but I woke up feeling renewed and I thought, okay, I'm starting the hold on campaign for suicide prevention, right? You know, and I'm going to make it larger, right? I'm going to do what I can. So in a way it's try, I mean, we, we're interconnected, but I'm trying to be less dependent on other people doing things for me, try to do something for myself and get it out there. So that's how the Hold On campaign started. But that happened a number of months after the song. You know, that didn't predate the song. That came a while after. In fact, quite a while after. Because the song was created, the initiation of the song was December 2020. And either the song was completed that month or January. 
and the hold on campaign. Um, um, I may be getting mixed up on the dates. Maybe it was 2022. I'd have to check all the dates of this. But the hold on campaign began um, July of 2023, right? So th there's like a, a, a time. Maybe it's a gestation time. And then I then I wrote another. The next song that I did, um, I read of the death of Naomi Judd, um, who's a country music icon. And she was going to, she was being initiated with her daughter, Winona, um, into the Country Music Hall of Fame. So on Sunday, she, she and her daughter were being inducted into the Country Music Hall of Fame. And on Saturday, she shot herself dead. So being able, being able to take my emotions and put them into poetry and a lyric, I wrote a poem called Lift You Up, which has a, it's a country music song. And it's all about, um, like, we're here to lift you up. And one of the lines, it's, it's okay to lay down the burden, but don't give up your life. You know, we're here to lift you up, right? And the song starts something like, you can never tell who's suffering, the most beautiful face, the most kind and loving heart, they hide their secret pain, right? So again, it was taking that heart-wrenching experience and trying to um, distill from it a healing message to help the next person. Uh, then the next song, and that became a, a, lyric, a lyric video, and I worked with, um, so a, a woman named Karina Yoder was the singer songwriter. Uh, and then I worked with a um, mix master producer, James Mano, and he thought to add guitars um, to it. And it, it's really a great song. <laughs> it's a great song. It's the kind of song you actually want to sing, right? Um, and then the next song was it was it was the debut of my hold on campaign um, effort. So I I was at a suicide prevention conference here in Portland. I had a display table, and I the first day it's it, it's in the light of day, right? When I came home from the conference, I read of the death of Sinead O'Connor. And Sinead O'Connor, again, a music icon, um, I, I thought, and I think most people in the world thought, based on her own mental history, that it could have been a suicide, or maybe it was a suicide. Um, when I read about her life, her son Shane had died the year before um, by suicide. And I think he was about 17 years old. And I wrote a poem the very next morning called Holding the Heart When It Breaks, which it very, very directly speaks on suicide. Like, how do you go on when you feel all love is gone, right? And how do you survive your child's suicide? And it's repeatedly asking the question, how do you go on, right? How do you go on when these things happen to you? And how do you go on when you feel like killing yourself? Um, and the end of the song um, answers that question, but I think answers that question very poignantly, um, talking about with the loved ones still in your heart, you know, to give you strength to go on. And also with all with all the tears and love in the world. That, that's how you go on. Um, and that song ended up winning, you know, best original song, best lyric song. Uh, and most recently, I, um, I read in December 2023, I read in the paper of the death of a, a musician named Esra Mohawk. And I didn't know of her, but in reading about her, she had written the, and performed the song um, Stronger Than the Wind. 
Uh, and that was also performed by Tina Turner, who had died also in 2023. And so when I'm reading the obituaries, I, I um, pulled up Esra Mohawk singing the song, and then I pulled up Tina Turner singing the song. And I had also read an article, this was all in the New York Times, I read an article also probably that day, which was about artists who had died in 2023 and quotes from them. And one of those artists was also Sinead O'Connor, and, and her quote was around the power of the spoken word. Like there's nothing stronger than that. And somehow reading about their deaths and also feeling sad about their deaths, I started thinking kind of spiritually, like where, where do you go when you die? Um, and am I gonna go somewhere where I die? And then I started thinking about the song, like, okay, on earth, you need to be stronger than the wind because metaphorically the wind is knocking you down all the time. So you have to be stronger than it. And then I'm thinking, yeah, but what if when you're dead, do you still have to be stronger than the wind, right? And then it, I thought to myself, no, you don't have to be stronger because you are the wind, right? Yeah. And, and and that led me to be writing the, the, the lyric um, that starts off like, um, where you go, my lovely, where you go, my darling, right? Are you in the um, uh, forevermore, right? Like the afterlife or, or are you in the nevermore, right? And then, then the chorus is all about crying and missing the person, being all alone. Uh, and the, again, the, the story of the lyric ends with an understanding about where that loved one might be, right? And, and the conclusion has to do with about feeling their love in the wind, right? Which originally, oh, and then I, I collaborated again with a singer-songwriter I found on Upwork. Um, she goes by um, um, the name of June and July. Uh, a beautiful song. It, it, it just won... Um, Best Lyric at the International Songwriters Day Festival and at that one Best Original Song at the um, Round the Globe Music and Film Festival. Um, originally, the song did not have to do with suicide. I, I was thinking more about people's dying in general, but then I thought more about the song. Um, and one of my um, collaborators, her name is Star... Um, Star Starlet, she said to me, you know, that, you know, it, it, did you write that about suicide? And I thought more about it. And I decided to especially dedicate it to suicide loss survivors. Um, and the video has the um, um, suicide prevention number and is also asking for donations to the Hold On campaign. So that that's <laughs> that, that's, that's, uh, that's a lot <laughs> that, that that's well it's interesting that that's where art can take you because yeah, I, I, yeah. because you're in a way i think maybe talking about that magnet that you're being drawn to follow something you know no definitely um firstly like um, well done on all your accomplishments and all the awards so there's two things like I want to touch on. I know like we approach in two hours. Like we could probably continue like for hours on this topic. You know, we probably need to like set up like a part two um, of this show. Like uh, what you were saying about Netflix, 13 Reasons Why. Yeah. And now this is coming from like a music business point of view. So on one hand, you're always going to have the mainstream who's pushing like some sort of narrative. Like I can at times, like I got this tendency of being like a bit controversial, sometimes extremely controversial, it depends what the topic is about. But at the end of the day is I'm just speaking my truth. So composers like yourself are always in competition now with the mainstream are pushing the narrative and your counter was 13 reasons why not. And you're always going to be like fighting that because as long as the mainstream has access to millions of people who are willingly, you know, wanting to sign up and watch this series, 
you're giving people the idea that it's okay to commit suicide. It's okay to be depressed. And then we have heroes like yourself now who are coming and saying, okay, 13 reasons why not. So extra work has to be put in now to push, you know, the counter forward on don't listen to this sort of like productions, compositions, don't watch these sort of series, don't take it literally and listen to the content on this and as well. And it's harder than ever. It's easier to be in the music industry these days, you know, as far as red tape or gatekeepers are concerned, it's cheaper. But it also takes a lot of like marketing budget to get your work, your message out there to the millions. And that's where a lot of uh, composers such as yourself, like I just like stuck right now, you know, and it, be, it can become frustrating. I'm sure you can relate to this. Whereas, look, I know my work can help millions of people, but now I'm tied down to only helping hundreds of thousands of people and it becomes frustrating and it takes, you know, a toll on you as well as a composer. So, like, when it comes to the Hold On campaign, um, what are your methods or strategies that you use besides people actually going on and doing all your artistic work and your visuals and so on? Is there any, are there any other methods that you use to get your work, like, public and in front of the right people? Yeah. Especially, like, with the lower class, um, like, the lower class in society because it's difficult, you know, more than ever. And, like, myself personally, I try to focus my attention to lower class because... The industry doesn't really focus on that 10%, that bottom 10%. So I try to push focus there. But it's hard. It's difficult. And it's not easy to face or to help those people in those sort of living conditions to believe, look, you don't have to go down this road. It is possible. Yes. Hold on. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And I, I want to go back just for a moment to like 13 reasons why that series um, that you don't want to get the message out or for people to be thinking like, well, of, of course you're going to kill yourself if these things happen to you, right? That That is not true, right? One does not, should or should not have to kill yourself as a result of various things happen to you, that there are other options for you to take. And those options should be highlighted, right? And, and I, I think that I know that 13 Reasons also had um, some talking points afterwards, right? And warning labels on the second time. I think they showed, you know, like the next season of the show. And I think they also had some of the actors talking about this as well. But I think that's also the danger, right, of... Um, when you have the lack of other awareness, right, that somebody could watch something like this and be so identifying with it that it's almost a justification for killing yourself, right? Um, yeah, yeah. But for the Hold On campaign, what uh, I also started doing something that I call, I call Gifts of Hope. Um, and I want to say, too, that other people out there who want to... Um, mount efforts for suicide prevention and to help me uplift mental health well-being, they can do these ideas too, like on their own. They could partner with the Hold On campaign or start their own campaign or reach out to other organizations where they live and partner. So Gifts of Hope started when I was at a community event with my you know, display table and a woman asked me, in, um, seeing all the things I had on the table, which is the artwork, and I'm going to talk about buttons and other things that I have. She she asked me like, so so what do you do, <laughs> right? Just like you're asking me, and and I really gave that thought. I really was thinking like, well, what do I do, and and how valuable is what I'm doing, and is there something more that I can be doing, right? And so the something more is uh, wanting to be on podcasts, right? Because I feel this is spreading the word, right? Just yep. just yep. by being here. To, and, and it's normalizing the conversation, right? Um, in the United States, um, suicide um, it, it is, I'm trying to remember the exact number. It's either the 10th or the 11th leading cause of death. Um, in, in my state of Oregon, it's the second leading cause of death in ages, um, I think like mid twenties up to mid thirties. 
And then it's the third leading cause for like 30 something to 40 something. Although I wanna say the, the highest rate of suicide is older white men, which is rarely talked about. Um, yeah. So yeah, so doing podcasts, um, doing mental health presentations, I mentioned um, doing for the Mental Health Academy, I've done presentations at um, medical schools, like Grand Rounds presentations. You know, I'd love to do it at other conferences. I would love for the music to be played at conferences, it, mental health conferences. Um, they should be played, right? Um, and the, and the uh, music video, you know, played, it's got the 988 number. Mental health organizations um, or other, um, um, helping people organizations can put the uh, song videos on their website free of charge. And um, I have the um, videos for a suicide, um, South African suicide prevention number. I have one for Australia and the United Kingdom. Um, in the U.S., it's 988. If people are interested in using it in their country, they can let me know what their number is. I would have uh, Lucia, the animator, update the video to share it with them. So that's a way to get out there. Um, also, um, I have a series of pins that I've done. Uh, the one pin um, says Suicide Survivor. And underneath, it has three hearts, which is kind of part of our logo. And it has the 988 number in, in that pin. And I think it's important because a suicide survivor could be someone who attempted su suicide and they survived. And it's also people who have lost loved ones to suicide. So I think that it, again, um, opens up the conversation and takes this out of kind of um, shame and stigma and silence to have a pin that says, I am a suicide survivor. Um, I also have a, a pin that, that says um, BE, B -E, B Pride, P R I D E, prevent suicide, right? Um, and uh, for the uh, LGBTQ plus population. Um, there, um, uh, I have um, stickers, one, a beautiful sticker that Amanda did with me. It's called Wings of Resilience. Uh, you know, people can put it on their water bottles. I mean, there's, there's all sorts of art that, you know, people can use as well. Uh, and if they're in touch with me, uh, that's available for purchase. But, you know, it's a low amount, and I use the money for the Hold On campaign. Um, I also have a monthly special event um, uh, through what I call the Arts and Healing Resiliency Center. It's free of charge. It's posted on Eventbrite. It's an hour and a half on a Sunday, and it's an arts and healing um, workshop. Um, and, and someone can, uh, I would very much encourage people to look at the website. Um, uh, all the songs are there. Uh, there's also a page for um, helping grieving hearts of suicide loss. There's a page for helping loss, grief, and physical pain because people in physical physical pain, let alone emotional pain, they can be at risk of suicide. Um, I collaborated on a project with a poet, um, Starlet Swan, who has um, complex regional pain syndrome. I, which is considered a suicide illness because of the severity of physical pain. I met Starlet through the Arts and Healing Resiliency Center when she joined one of the workshops. And we ended up um, meeting a few days later and she shared an, a, an amazing poem that she wrote called The Marble Block um, about encountering a huge marble block in her life, which really was signifying her illness that was destroying her. And I heard her poem, and just like Kevin had said, do you want that to be an opera? I said to Starlet, that would be a beautiful animation. Do you want that to happen? And I, we collaborated with Lucia, made it into an animation. I renamed her poem, which was The Marble Block. I called it Marble Me Free. And that has won international awards. 
uh, and we started uh, the Marble Me Free Initiative, which is linked to the Hold On campaign. It has its own website, but the goal of the Marble Me Free Initiative is to help break the cycle of pain and suicide. And you know we're available for presentations and workshops. So uh, and just to look at the website and send a message to me. Yeah. And I love to Seven collaborate. Months. So if there are yeah, singer yeah. songwriters and poets and artists out there, I very much like to be with kindred spirits. No doubt. Like we we living in this era of collaboration and networking. That's the era that we're living in right now. You know, you can't accomplish whatever the goal or mandate might be for anyone. It's really difficult to rule alone. And you just need like the right partners to actually get that mandate out. So crazy idea. Like, okay, maybe not that crazy. So you've got now this presence in South Africa, got Australia, got the UK. Have you ever thought of you know, with all these people that you are now networking with, like, I don't just want, like, you know, our conversation or this podcast to be like, okay, let's have a conversation. We put it up, it's on Spotify, it's on YouTube, and so on. People listen to it, people don't. Some people actually take it to heart. They visit the site. There has to be like, I'm just, generally, I'm just like that. There has to be like, you know, something bigger that I want to actually do to it. How about creating like a Facebook page, which, I mean, I could assist you with, you could get, whoever you know in Australia and UK to assist you with that and create like the hold on campaign, Australia, the hold on, hold oh, on campaign. Oh, that is beautiful. I never UK, thought of that. Hold That's on a campaign very South good Africa. idea. And I could just like, you know, I could manage the page in South Africa for you. And all I have to do is just integrate the content from the website and other resources yeah. onto that page. You know, that is a because, wonder, fantastic idea, really. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, because, you know, like the tendency, and I'm not sure how it is, like, you know, in other countries, but like in South Africa, for example, there's a small percentage of individuals like me that actually look like across the border, over the border for mm. assistance. There's still artists who are like battling musically as well because they, uh, they're not looking further than their nose. You know, they're looking at what's happening, okay, within the country, how corrupt the music industry is at the moment. They're still looking for like a record label to sign them, yet they don't know or don't have the resources and education that can be passed on from the mainstream, but it's not, that look, you can actually do it yourself. So it'll like be easier for me to actually get people and look, when it comes to suicide, South Africa is no different. I don't know what that exact number is, but it's up there, you know, it's trending. It is up there, especially with, you know, your Gen Zs. It's like becoming even like, they're more emotional these days. You know, I chatted to my sister a couple of weeks ago and she was like how sensitive my nephew is and how people his age are actually committing suicide or they want to commit suicide. And she was telling me the story about a girl um, like within the area who I think she was like 13. She was 13. You know, once again, she was happy. Everything was cool. The next day she took a bottle of medication. It's over. You know, so they're very sensitive. Um, there, I was going to say that apropos of what you're saying, you know, that although having a um, psychiatric illness, right, be that major depression, uh, severe anxiety disorder, bipolar disorder, um, schizophrenia, being psychotic or whatever, that there, there can be a potential risk of suicide for certain psychiatric illnesses and certain life circumstances. However, a person does not have to be mentally ill or have a mental health diagnosis to kill themselves. Sometimes a person becomes so devastated through relationship issue breakups that they end up killing themselves now that's that's important for people to understand yeah 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 no correct correct so yeah so i think you know for us to bring more awareness and to share all your music and your work and your visuals which is you know, one thing i want to touch on before we go on to you reading out your poem um is that you know fold me like whatever content you may have on hand, which, you know, I won't find online, such as the logos and so on. And you no, know, we just create those pages because it'll be easier for me to actually pull in people who are going through depression and anxiety 
knowing it's linked to a local page and actually getting someone to now look at content or pages actually across the board. They'll be like, oh no, you know, like well, how we started off the podcast today. But do they know? They don't know what I'm going through. You know, she stays in another country. It's that sort of negative mentality that people actually have. So like we sort of have to find like this bridge to you that's going to be like easier for people to be, you know, relatable to. You know, if you agree with that. And then we can just... Yeah, like, I think that's a that wonderful country. idea. Yeah, to country. And then we can just push it and build the momentum on it because the cause is extremely important. And as we... So as I said, you know, we're up against, you know, the norm of, like, you know, it's okay to do it when it actually isn't. There is help out there. There is people out there besides, you know, the usual authorities that actually do care and want to help you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, this morning, and I had sent you an email this morning, how I was um, reading a Facebook page. It's a private Facebook group, and it's on suicide loss survivors um, and support, right? And it, suicide loss survivor in terms of, um, you know, my friend who died, you know, my, my patient who died, uh, my... Um, when I had been married, my ex-father-in-law also died by suicide. Uh, with integrity, I had joined this group for, for my, my own healing. And reading this page, um, it's an endless number of people of sending posts and new people joining. And the heartbreak that is in these posts, these people's real life experiences of their husband, their wife, their daughter, their sister, their twin, their best friend, right? Um, it's, it's just, tra it's so tragic. And sometimes you're reading of multiple people in the same family who have died by suicide. And the person yeah. writing the post sometimes is talking about that they don't know how they can go on after the suicide of their loved one. Um, True. True. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I want to recommend, I wanna recommend a, a, there are many books to recommend, but one book I read recently is called Bearing the Unbearable. And I really recommend that book. I'll repeat the title. It's called Bearing the Unbearable. Um, so having read the post this morning, I, I felt compelled to, to write a poem slash lyric. And I called it my crying song to you. And it goes, words can't express the heartbreak pain I feel from losing you. Melodies can't undo the tears and the hurt, I cry because I'm missing you. And you're not here to hear me. Poems can try, but it's a lie to say they change reality. What am I to do? A part of me died. If you were by my side, would you comfort me? And death calls out in the dark hours. I know I need to live on, but it's not easy to do. Life isn't always what it's supposed to be. I want to hide in the pain, secret away and be with you, but it's also ever true. It's never too late to be alive again. Even though you've left all of me and life behind, I still can make the choice to hope and live and love again. Because deep in my heart, I know that's what you'd want me to do. Wow. <laughs> like I told you on the email, you know, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's impactful. I, so I, you message, know, I, also, yeah, I, I also want to share with you. Sorry for interrupting. Um, no, no, it's fine. Uh, an original thought with the, the songs that I had done or have done is um, if people wanted to do cover songs of those songs, I would be very interested in that. 
and for, for people who have used the creative arts to help their own healing, whether that's you know poetry or painting or dance or songwriting, if they want to share their creative works and hold on strategy, you know, with the hold on campaign, then we would post your um, artwork or song and your strategy um, on our social media. And there's a way to um, share that with us on the hold on campaign website. So, you know, what I was going to say, like, but you already said, you know, your message is to poets and artists out there who want to join and bring their creative, you know, talents, or, you know, on board with you. So it's like, on one hand, we want to bring more awareness to suicide prevention. And I feel like we can also initiate like this global mandate of bringing artists from different countries and different backgrounds, different cultures on board to also put out their own, you know, versions that can help the cause. That mm -hmm. will, you know, also, because one thing I also push with independent artists, uh, which is something I said at the start also, that they need to have that sort of purpose. And if you haven't found your purpose yet, maybe this could be it. You just don't realize it yet, you know. Or well, it's a thought that crossed your mind, but you're like, oh, okay, there's nothing I can do. No one listens to me, whatever. Let me give up. But we take on the responsibility of creating the platforms that makes it easier for those artists to actually showcase their work that fights the cause of suicide prevention. You know, sort of like people get those sparks again and be like, okay, cool. Yeah, we got an opportunity again. Now we got a platform to actually shine. Yes. And, and the... The Hold On Campaign for Suicide Prevention um, on the About page, you'll read, the Hold On Campaign for Suicide Prevention um, uplifts mental health well-being by using the power of art to connect, express, and heal, right? So it's, it's about suicide prevention, but it is very much involved in using the expressive arts, right? Yeah. So it's, it's both things. So it's an, it's an opportunity for people to um, share of themselves, of their own, potentially of their own life or their own empathy for other people that they love that have gone through things and their creative expressions that not only help themselves, but help others. And I think that's what the hero or the heroine's journey is all about. Right, that at the end of the the journey has not ended until you return, right? Having learned what you've learned and sharing it with your community to help them. You know, that that's yeah. what that's what it means to be a, a hero. And and I Follow think um, and, and, and I think and um we can all be a hero, right? Yeah, right. No, definitely. <laughs> it, I'm not sure if you are familiar with the author Robin Sharma. I don't think so. So his whole global mandate is about each and every single human being on earth can be a hero. And that's what like his lecture is about, his books are about. You are a hero. Doesn't matter at what scale. You know, you don't have to be like I don't know, like a superhero in the sky yeah. or someone who's going to take on public office or someone who is actually a celebrity that's doing charitable work. If you just take it upon yourself, even in your community, yeah. you can be a hero to those people. You know, be a hero to yourself and to those people. It is possible, you know. So, yeah, I mean, that's something that we can all just take into consideration. And, and, that, I, and that idea, too... It, it, it's a life-saving idea because I think when we discover I, I have a purpose or I can, you know, my showing up and, I don't know, being with someone, talking to them, that I, I'm, I'm providing a service. That person might need me, right? And, the, and that can help a person to hold on. Like, okay, there, there's a reason that I'm here. I can do something. The million dollar question, why am I here? Which is what everyone just needs to like ask themselves. It's it's <laughs> one of the exercises I do with uh, new artists who come on board as clients is I got a questionnaire for them to actually define who are they. So by evaluating that, you know which direction you're actually gonna be going into. And nine out of ten don't know who they are. 
they are lost. You know, they have no idea who they are. And now you have to like work on that first. And many of them do give up, which is sad, but it also makes it difficult for me to continue if you're not going to spend time in evaluating who you are. It's no point we go down this road because it's just going to end up in disaster for you and your career. And most of them just give up. They like just go back to what they were doing before they decided to follow their heart and follow their dream. And you have to create. You have to, you have to create who you are. Yeah, it's, it's a yeah. creation who you are. <laughs> that that's someone that's something I can also. You, you, you be, it's like you become who you are. Like I, right. I mean, I mean, okay. I don't, I don't know. You know, I'm just gonna say this. I don't know if it's true or not, but. I was the girl who plagiarized the poetry, right? Right, right. right so right. I was a I was a poet, kind of, back then. And in my life, I became that which I was trying to be through another person, not of myself. So it, I think that idea that be, becoming who you are is a process. And of course, as a process, you have to take the risk. You have to have the courage. Yeah. It's not easy, but you have to keep on trying. You have to put yourself out there. Yeah. It's like a lot of youngsters these days who think they have it all figured out at a young age, but you become so many different people as you move along. You know, at 10 years old, you're one person. At 15, you're a different person. At 18, you're a different person. At 25, Our what you lives. want to when you were 10. It's completely different, you know. So, you're, as you said, you know, you just have to trust that process, you know, and just go with it and blend into it as it hits you and just know that it's hitting you, you know, for a reason and a bigger meaning. So, I one, one more thank thing. Thank you, Pino. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> so, just, yeah, I just want to, like, one more thing before, you know, we conclude, like, so when it comes to the artistic process of all your content, your visuals, is it randomly selected or is it created to blend in, you know, with the lyrics and so on? Um, well, I've, I've collaborated with, you know, diff with Lucia, the animation artist and um, Mandy, the visual artist, um, that it's really, um, and all the, the artists for the books, right? Hadley and Olia, um, that it, it, really to unify right the the theme the beauty of the writing or the theme of the writing so i um it, it's not um random at all right um that do you know when when something is all of a piece where it's like all coming together right um that that visual artwork so much embodies what the words are trying to evoke. Uh, that's what I'm going for. And I've been so fortunate to work with people where we're really what simpatico, right? That, that we're uh, working in unison. And also um, I've been able to give input, which I have become more able as I become more confident in myself to say, you know, have you tried this or please try it that way, right? That's happened with some of these um, songwriting or the singing or the music where, where I'll um, contribute even a, a bit more um, to what, it, what they're manifesting visually. Um, and um, because even though I may not have that exact image, of course, in my head, I can feel when it's right. You know, there's like that, yes, you know, that's beautiful. And there's, uh, and that word beauty can be not only when something is like, I don't know, quote, traditionally beautiful, but when it, it's the essence of something, you know, when it taps into that essence, I think that in itself is beauty, right? It may be something very painful that's being described, but if you're able to describe that or draw that, with accuracy and feeling and empathy, there's a beauty to that, you know? Yeah, no, definitely there is a beauty and it's organic. And one of the reasons I actually asked the question is because there's so many tools out there that artists are using where it can just like sink in. You get where I'm going with this. Like you could write uh, certain lyrics and you can 
link it down to a composition, to that sheet music, and then upload it on a specific software. Yeah. And I can automatically like, you know, give you visuals that can align with that. It's like, have you seen those lights that move with the music that you get these yes. days, you know? Mm -hmm. The BPM goes up, it moves with that, yeah. goes down, moves with that. So you get that. So if you're still an artist who's still doing organic work, like a big ups to you, you know, big ups to you for doing that, you know. That can seriously take you a long way and build that intimate relationship with your audience and who you want to actually interact with you. And I, and so, I enjoy when I said working with kindred spirits, it makes me so happy um, that in a collaboration, each of our works can shine, right, individually yeah, and together. Yeah. And that, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, people like Lucia um, can be recognized for, you know, her great ability right i that that makes me happy you know that, that i i want to also uh, just as they might want to help me develop my talent and my outreach i want to help them develop their talents and outreach too yeah yeah no perfect perfect, perfect. i think we could talk forever <laughs> yeah no we can on this topic you know we can i mean like this, this is actually longer than like when I interact with artists, you know, like just traditional standard artists are just there making their pop music and so on. And we talk about their early life and career mm -hmm. and so on. But this is like a really sensitive topic, you know, and so I, you could just go on for hours and hours on it. And when you finish that, then you know you can go on for more because something else happens tomorrow. Like there can be different components, you know, like each time a suicide happens based on like a different reason, not all the time, but you know, it could be a different reason. Then you start researching into that. But yeah, but, no, that's a question. You know, I, 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 also, I also want to mention to you, talk, talking about suicide, that you can also think of um, the individuals who died, right? All, all the life and energy and love and contribution, right? That those people who are no longer living, all that's lost, right? Not only, yeah. right, that, that person in that moment of time, but all of what they would have become never happened, right? Yeah, and yeah. Um, I have next to me uh, on my chair, which has a number of things on it, there's a chair right over here. I have a, a picture of Tina Turner smiling from when she was wow. a young, young age. And I'm actually gonna take the picture and show you. So I have this picture of Tina Turner right next to me. and. Tina, Tina Turner attempted suicide when she was a young woman, right? And she was medically hospitalized, you know, because of it. And it was uh, truly an attempt to end her life. And thank God, right, she yeah. was not successful in killing herself. Look, look what she in her own life would have lost and makes me teary thinking of it. And the whole world would have lost, right? So that also inspires me to do what I can, right? So I so now now um, and of course you know I mentioned about the for you my lovely song was inspired by Astro Mohawk and Tina Turner. So now I have that picture of her and she's smiling at me to uh, you know to keep the faith and do yeah, good in yeah. the world. Yeah. I guess, you know, the era that we both like grew up in, you know, you had more of Tina Turner than I could have ever had. And surprisingly enough, like I also did a deep dive into the life of Tina Turner. I never come across anything related to suicide. So was this, and this now is for my own curiosity, was this during her marriage with Ike Turner or was it before she turned 18 that she attempted to commit suicide? No, I'll, I'll have to... I don't remember offhand. I'll have to email you about that. Um, but I know it It was when, I think it was when she was with Ike. Um, I, I also wrote something up uh, linking the Hold On campaign with Tina Turner and asking for donations. And it starts off, did you know Tina Turner, you know, attempted suicide and what the world would have lost if she had died? Yeah. You know? I, I, apropos of that, I um, I received, I think it's through the internet, that, that award, um, the International Songwriters Award, um, that um, 
they gave, as part of the, the award for best whatever, they gave a um, gift certificate to the Guitar Center. So it was like maybe $150 or something to the Guitar Center. So I went to the Guitar Center and ended up buying a keyboard for my grandchildren. Um, but I spoke to them about the Hold On game. I explained why I was there and won this award. And it's especially dedicated to suicide loss survivors. And then I ask them, is it okay if I can come in September, which is Suicide Prevention Month, and give out, you know, gifts of hope, suicide prevention, you know, um, uh, materials, pins, and the business card. I also have, and I don't know if you can see this, I have on my wrist, it's a wristband, and it says, hold on, don't give up. And on the back, it says, call 988, save your life. And wow. that... Right. And that's also right. I met a woman who had been in one of the uh, community fairs. No, she had been at NAMI walks and came over to where I was. And uh, she and I um, ended up having lunch together a month or two later. And at NAMI walks, she had taken the art cards. She said she wanted to give them out in the community. And she also took us one of the bracelets and she said, and she was wearing it when I met her for lunch. And she says she never takes it off. So these these little things can make a difference. Oh, definitely, definitely. It all like builds up, you know. Like people really focus on the small things, you know, they're like looking at the macro of things, but it yeah. was the small things that actually built it. But the small things do matter. That it goes a long way. It goes a long way. I mean, if you can get thousands of people just to wear the one band and spread that message just by using the band, it's a job well done. Thank you, Kina. But, uh, I know yeah. we're going to be yeah. in touch together <laughs> <laughs> and start the uh, Hold On campaign, South Africa. That's great. Yeah, no. So, uh, yeah. So, I mean, you can send me all the content you may have. I can get that sorted out for you. We can get that page up, you know. It's a quick thing to do and just to manage and just to like integrate all the content and let it flow, you know, and then we can build on the momentum and see we're pulling because these people, I believe, that are out there locally and as you know, internationally, they do need people like you around. Mm -hmm. So thank you, you know, so um, much I, for... Well, um, Kino, um, I think September the 10th is World Suicide Prevention Day. So okay. uh, maybe we can, you will be in touch, but maybe we can debut the uh, Facebook page on September the 10th. Yeah, no, that's perfect. Completely up to you. I'm okay. just there to assist you. You know, this is just an idea that I have. You can tell me, you know, how you want to go about it. And, you know, we take with them. We all help each other at the end of the day. Thank no you, Kino. But thank you so much for the time that you've taken to be here. This was really insightful and enjoyable, especially for me. Like, you know, Viewers, yes, okay, cool. <laughs> but, you know, for me as well, you know, this was really yeah. cool. This was really, really cool. And keep doing what you do. You know, the world needs people like you. And it's special. So thank you. Thank you for your contribution to the world, to Thanks, the music Gina. industry, to art, to society. It really is <laughs> thank you. Really amazing. Okay, bye, everybody. Okay, thank bye, you. So Gina. we'll chat soon. Okay, bye. Bye.